Actually, I noticed dependent origination before knowing about dependent origination in myself, before even knowing about Buddhism. Um, because I realized when I was learning English, for example, that, well, like I can't express myself the same way that I express myself in French. I just think languages also is a really good kind of window to kind of showing us our how we build our personalities and how we uh, cling to, you know, who we are. Uh, and then started to kind of trickle in that understanding of, hmm, what is that personality anyways? <laughs> and and this will, this is, this is the sutta for that. This is the talk for that. So... Tonight's uh, talk is a little bit more uh, interactive. So last night was a bit of a kind of a putting our toe in the water of dependent origination. We saw a little bit of <laughs> we saw a little bit of what it, what it could be like uh, to touch upon that topic. <laughs> it can it can be a, it it can create a lot of papancha in itself. It can create a lot of uh, proliferation just to talk about it <laughs> and uh, often it's a it's viewed as a very uh, kind of a, a deeper teaching uh, definitely in, in Buddhism I like to try to keep it light in in uh, in sharing that teaching because there's there's ways that um, it can be understood that is just uh, quite simple actually and not uh, uh, not so heavy and dense and uh, rigorously academic. And so that's why I made this little uh, sheet that you have now, this diagram with nice little pictures. And uh, we will be moving through, through that tonight. And so this dependent origination is quite important uh, for us to understand because this is basically how our experience comes about and how we create our experience, how uh, we create our own reality. And it's uh, quite profound, yet it is very useful and it can be understood in a quite uh, simple way. I would say, uh, Bhante Vimalaramsi would say that um, dependent origination is like the spine of the Dhamma, the spine of the teaching. It's like uh, where everything else comes out from. And it's that's kind of true. It's like the, the spine of the Buddha, basically. <laughs> the spine of his teaching. And it kind of, it's this upright thing that is very central and everything else starts from there. And hopefully this will give us a little bit of a glimpse tonight of that. And so, this sutta begins by the Buddha saying, I say that there, it is by knowing and seeing that the mental distractions become still, not by not knowing and not seeing. Knowing and seeing what? This is body or matter. This is body arising. This is body passing away. These are experiences. These are experiences arising. These are experiences passing away. These are perceptions. These are perceptions arising. These are perceptions passing away. 
These are mental activities. These are mental activities arising. These are mental activities passing away. That sound familiar? This is consciousness. This is consciousness arising and this is consciousness passing away. Knowing and seeing in this way, monks, there is the stilling of distractions. Hmm, interesting. So, Bhante Buddha, do you mean that by letting go of craving and clinging and attachment and habitual tendencies, we start to see that reality is more like a flow. It just goes and it goes because we're not latching onto anything. So nothing is actually stopping in our field of perception. This is a very interesting uh, standpoint. And maybe you've heard me uh, talk a little bit about this when uh, distractions on interviews, when distractions arise or in the meditation, different, so many kinds of experiences can, can be uh, felt, can be uh, seen. Some people will, you know, see light. Some people will have like very different um, sensations in the body and uh, we get to see the whole spectrum. It's very different from one person to the next. There's nothing exactly uh, the same. But uh, slowly, slowly, we habituate uh, um, meditators to get familiar with certain kinds of understanding and vocabulary. And more and more, you'll hear us say, yeah, that's OK. Just allow it to come and it'll go and allow it when it comes allow it to be there when it goes that's okay no problem but don't uh don't buy into you know uh the storyline of it if you see lights not trying to analyze what it is it's there fine no problem it's arising then it passes away one day the light is purple, the other day the light is blue, <laughs> the other day the light is red. Um, sometimes it's a tingling sensation, sometimes it's a burning sensation, sometimes it's a wind sensation, sometimes it's all kinds of things. It, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Like we saw yesterday, it's just a contact with a sense, door, and there's an experience coming out of it. It's there. That's the truth. We can't, we can't fight that. I mean, I'm sitting in front of everybody here. I'm sitting on a mat. I'm feeling the mat under me. Uh, this, like, I cannot wish for another experience. I can't say, like, I want to see unicorns and butterflies. It's just not going to happen. You guys are still going to be there. And your beautiful group, don't worry, I'm not saying. <laughs> we all like unicorns and butterflies. but um, And so uh, Bhante would say, you can't fight with the truth. That's the truth of our experience. And when we start to fight with that, then that's when we create tension, friction, and problems, troublesomeness. And so interestingly, it starts with, this is called usually anicca sanya, so the perception of impermanence, of, of transience. Things, I like this, to, to break down that compound in Pali, anicca, it's not staying. So it's always going, going, going. And one of the, um, one of the things that I really like doing, I started doing that um, when I was back home, I rarely go back to my home in Quebec, uh, but sometimes I go back, and uh, that was quite a few years ago. And we have this slow, I live on the countryside, it's uh, farmer's fields, and um, uh, it's very slow, kind of country river that kind of meanders through the fields, and uh, we just go there, and it's not much water, it's not like, it's not like a really big river. But um, just enough so that I could like put my whole body in and be kind of supported. And only my, my face was out and uh, I was breathing and I could feel this moving water just over me. 
uh, and I just started actually using that as a meditation because of the water is kind of a more mm, a bit a bit coarser than usual uh, our usual sensations it's actually quite uh, uh, calming also and I could just uh, stay there and just feel this constant flow of it's all going it's always going there's always more water coming and washing through and there's no as long as we're alive that's our experience is a river, our reality is a river, whether it's from the body, uh, sensory experience, whether it's perceptions, and whether it's mental activity, mental constructs, or consciousness. And we'll see that in the later stage of this talk, how even consciousness is a flow. And so I've actually, um, I really like that and I recommend it to anybody <laughs> who wants to try it. It's really, it's really great if you have a small river or a creek anywhere. I did that in Sri Lanka too sometimes and uh, lately in, in Kalimpong in the mountains, uh, and that's where I mostly stay nowadays and I'll be speaking about that later, but um, there's a place where I go, it's like a big rock, kind of an outcrop, and uh, there's this nice cool wind that comes to, and I kind of sit there and do the same thing. And uh, just kind of feeling the constant washing away of the constant flow of the wind or the water kind of puts me in that very kind of still space. And so, yeah, you can try that. That's just my uh, <laughs> invitation, open invitation. And now we will begin the, to look into the little chart. And this will be somewhat interactive. Um, it's not that complicated, don't worry. <laughs> and then, because the Buddha often did that, he often had uh, quite an interaction uh, relationship with his audience. It wasn't always just a straight monologue. It was often like questions to the bhikkhus and the bhikkhus would reply. And, and so you will be the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis tonight. <laughs> and so he says, but monks and nuns, I say in this stillness, because we're talking about the Asavakaya here, and um, the, the Asavakaya here I translate as um, the stilling of distractions, so that it's more accessible for us. Um, Asava has, um, in its meaning, uh, comes from the root shru, and shru means to flow, like I think I explained on like day two or something. And uh, here it's like, um, it can also be interpreted as uh, asavakaya is like the, the withering, the drying up of the mental kind of streams outside to all of these things. And so there is that stillness, there is that kind of experience of there's no more flowing of the mind outside. In this stillness, the experience of that stilling comes from a cause. It is not independent. And here we have the, the Buddha. The Buddha on top, the stilling of, stilling of the mind, the stilling of all distractions. This is the Asavakaya. So this talk is a reverse order. So we will make our way back down from full awakening, <laughs> no big deal, don't worry, <laughs> to Buddha, <laughs> to understand, okay, so, and that's the beauty of this teaching from the Buddha too, he's like saying, okay, so that, that's, that's it, like that's, and this has a cause, it came about from a thing, it, it, it doesn't come about from nothing, well, I mean, <laughs> for those of you who like like koans <laughs> but um, it does it does come from a condition uh, it, it is brought about through some causes and so what is uh, what is the cause for the experience of that stillness so monks and nuns what is the cause for the experience of that stillness 
it would be it would be on the sheet <laughs> and it would be but then i can't give it to you you have to kind of figure out which one of the four next ones are be yes um well basically it's it's just under for this one i'll give you a hint Yes, vimutti, vimutti, yeah. So asavakaya is dependent on vimutti. Vimutti is often translated as, and this is where you can uh, pen down or write down the classical uh, words. Vimutti would be kind of liberation uh, in the, like Bhikkhu Bodhi translates that as liberation. And Asavakaya, he translates that as the destruction of the taints. That's the one. <laughs> the battlefield. <laughs> For those of you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, so um, basically this is something I understand more like a it's not something that's being released, but it's like, um, you know, when I gave the talk on the um, jhanas, at the end, uh, there's that, um, uh, in that release, one knows this is release. I think that's what it's referring to. It's like more of this end kind of result mm -hmm. of the end of the kind of the path, mm -hmm. the practice. But there's, you know, like in, in all of this, there's so many synonyms and the Buddha is always kind of changing things around a little bit. So I think we need to keep uh, some, some looseness around these terms. But you'll see just down below, uh, not too long from now, disengagement, that's another place where that's more like the active kind of, or, and then below there's like Pasadi also. So that element is always there, but this release vimutti is like this kind of like breaking free kind of thing. Yeah. So that would be more yeah. this. Once there is that breaking free, anyways, that's how I understand it, is that the mind is completely still. You know, there's no more movements. Okay. Yeah, I have heard vimutti being translated as freedom. But it's really yes, free. yes. Yes, I would totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing that I really like is to keep an open mind when reading the suttas because it's so rich. And anyone who knows more than one language knows that translation is not a black and white thing. You know, it's... You can't... Like my first language is French and I noticed that uh, when I was starting to learn English for example and then other languages uh, like Sinhalese and uh, like Spanish uh, and you know actually I noticed dependent origination before knowing about dependent origination in myself before even knowing about Buddhism um, because I realized when I was learning English for example that well, like I can't express myself the same way that I express myself in French. And therefore there was a big chunk of my personality which I couldn't transfer. <laughs> and so just the way that, um, and that personality, that's what I mean by that. And it started to kind of trickle in that understanding of, hmm, what is that personality anyways? <laughs> And because, you know, it's all conditioned, like you have friends, you speak the same language, you have similar expressions, you have body language that is relating to that. And then when you change your language, you change the circle of friends, you change the bodily expressions, you can't express yourself in the same way. So it's very, very different. It's a, you know, it's a constant kind of a check on the mind to be like, hmm. Yeah, I don't have any kind of landmarks for like <laughs> for this right now. <laughs> I don't know like what to do with my body or like how to say that or so um yeah, I just think languages also is a really good kind of window to kind of showing us our 
how we build our personalities and how we uh, cling to you know who we are uh, and and this will this is this is the sutta for that this is the talk for that so very good we're done with the first one yay <laughs> But this release comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for release? This vimutti. And of course, you know, we're not expecting to like really understand everything about this, every single word tonight. We're just kind of, you know, bringing that up. Uh, it takes a lifetime if you ask me uh, you know that's the beauty of it is we just keep reflecting on it and it, it deepens all the time so samadhi yeah maybe if you try the other end <laughs> agitation yeah viraga yeah freedom from agitation and this is usually called uh, dispassion Another trauma triggering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I choose freedom from agitation. It's, it's really hard to pin down that, that word because viraga, one thing that I've noticed is um, it is used in the suttas. It has mainly two functions. One of them is that kind of, usually it's called dispassion which in our society right now, like maybe 70 years ago when the Pali dictionary was kind of put together, it was not as kind of... Uh, that, that word passion, I think, is really related to like um, more probably the Christian background in uh, the United Kingdom at that time. And that's where the, the Pali text society was. That's where the Pali English dictionary was laid down. So, you know, we have to understand this context, you know, so and my my own goal in doing this is to actually offer a, a bit of a f more fresh, fresher perspective on it. I like uh, and so this passion. Yeah, that's one of the ways that we can find it. But also it comes in the jhanas as piti um, acha viraga and that's not the joy becoming dispassionate in the third jhana that is the joy calming down toning down and so viraga is like rag, raga is like being like agitated raga is a synonym of tanha and that's also another really interesting place and so in this sutta, we have the classical 12 links of dependent origination, which we haven't touched yet. And we are now in the transcendental aspect. This is where um, we're not really in the, um, uh, the process of how we condition by craving, clinging, attachment, and all that. But this is where we're breaking free from that. And so, if we understand that structure is that basically this is the antidote like this is the third and the fourth noble truth here that we're talking about on this page that's why i made it in two page pages and then here which starts with the toilet bowl <laughs> i'll get to that later um and this is this is the deep down uh, dependent origination, which is like the classical kind of uh, approach. And I'll we'll walk through the whole thing. Yes. Yes. I think it is. Yeah. I totally think it is. I think that's like the opposite of tanha, mm. that the Buddha is saying viraga. Mm. There we go. So this is where tanha is brought to an end. And that's why I was saying, you know, yesterday I'm really, uh, I do feel like we're putting way too much emphasis on the first and second noble truths. And one of my uh, goals in my work is to actually bring forth where the third and the fourth noble truths are, because they are there all the time. So, 
uh, and freedom from agitation. Raga is also, uh, you know, raga is like, like in English we have like a, a close, like rage, rage. But uh, it's not exactly that, but I mean, it's quite close semantically. And so um, just offering that for your reflection, uh, I use, uh, I translate viraga as calming down or to calm down, to settle down, um, to become unagitated also. I often translate it like that. And so freedom from agitation, viraga, comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for freedom from agitation? Nibida, yes. Disengagement. That is the disenchantment. So this is the rough part. And even though we're, we're in like, even though we're in the transcendental um, uh, chain, here see how still the kind of, the, this kind of tinge of negativity is kind of still brought through where you have like disenchantment and dispassion. I understand these terms and they work. I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but I'm just saying that, you know, there might be some more luminous terms that we can use. <laughs> uh, like, like freedom from agitation, like being unagitated, like the end of craving. That's a little bit better to me anyways. And then uh, Nibida is, um, I like to translate it as disengagement. Nibida, I f find, is quite close semantically or like in its meaning to Viveka also. And that's another place where uh, we could find that here. Uh, that would be quite fitting uh, because in that change, we don't have Viveka. That word doesn't come up here, but that would be a really good place. Um, I actually see throughout my translations, I've seen quite a lot of, you know, at, interchangeability between these terms if you if you do what's viveka viveka is uh basically um i translate it as letting go but uh technically it would mean like detachment uh, viveka comes from the root which which means uh to to cut away to like cut loose which now it's being translated as seclusion and um, but the thing is i it's not that it doesn't work again uh, but translating it as letting go when i've been uh, after doing that for a while i feel like it sticks really well uh, seclusion has another um, seclusion has another a uh, better term in Pali, which is patisallana. And uh, patisallana is more that kind of, you know, like being a hermit kind of thing. It's like kind of secluding yourself, like um, going away kind of thing. That has more like that connotation. Whereas viveka is more like, you know, in English we have that word letting go. And in the Pali dictionary, if you look, there is no word for that. Like it hasn't been used. There's no word for letting go, uh, really. So I think that's a big... That's a modern, modern word. Yeah, relative, yeah. And I think it needs to be in there. <laughs> that's my humble opinion. So viveka and nekama, like renunciation, these are two words that I'll be translating as letting go instead of seclusion and renunciation, which really changes the teaching into a more like a doable here and now dynamic kind of organic process whereas you could think that renunciation you have to become a monastic to do this you don't you just it's like so um well i mean you can become a monastic do it you know <laughs> please do it but i mean i'm just saying that you don't have to so yeah 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 so nibida um like I said, I'll use different words with different people, different audiences. Um, nibida, one of the words that I like, actually that's not, I didn't come up with it. It's like a turning away or like, cause it's, it's a bit softer. It's a bit more gentle. 
or becoming wary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that one I like too. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So there is that too. There is like different gradients of flavors in there. Um, it's just a matter, that's the thing about translation is that there's never going to be a, one that is spot on. And, you know, uh, like in India, uh, the, the languages, the culture is a lot more spiritual. You know, they have a lot of vocabulary around spirituality. And it's like a culture of spirituality, which is, I, I love that personally. But uh, in English, it's, we don't have that same vocabulary. So we have to kind of come up with different terms that have been used in different contexts, like uh, different religions, for example. Uh, so it's not impossible, but it's just, you know, we have to be aware of that. Uh, so I had really good conversations with another, uh, uh, with other uh, friends in, in India who were, were just talking about that, how, you know, in India it's like, it's, it's the language, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the spiritual language for that. And we have like all of these terms, it's like uh, a lot of them are still unused. So it's, uh, and a lot of them have changed uh, also. But uh, the other thing that is interesting is that um, if you l spend quite a bit of time in the Pali dictionary, Pali English dictionary, you'll notice that, and that's something that I keep coming up upon, it's really not original. <laughs> um, like you'll be searching many terms and by the way there's a lot less vocabulary in Pali than there is in English like it's a very smaller much smaller pool of 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 words like much much smaller I can't remember the numbers but so there's a lot less choice and when you look up words in the Pali and their translation in English it's very limited like a lot of words like viveka patisalana and many of these words they'll be translated as seclusion and so it's like we we end up with a very 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 narrow pool of words and so that's why it seems even more repetitive sometimes and uh, it's because there's not we're still using a dictionary that's really like it was beautiful work you know like what they did if you read about it and it was basically like grappling in the dark like they had no idea at first what it was they started with sanskrit and it's beautiful work and it's actually quite well done with the etymology and the proto-indo-aryan you know roots and it's really like they go deep but our understanding of buddhism and the english language has changed quite a bit since then and so and we're using the same dictionary so it's it's good that we kind of open this up a little bit but this this engagement this nibbida comes from a cause it is not independent what is the cause of for disengagement monks and nuns <laughs> Mm. Yes, yata bhuta nyada This and this is this is what uh, is usually translated as um, uh, seeing things for what they are, the knowledge and vision of things as they truly are. It's a pretty long compound. I like to call it discernment, <laughs> um, just to make it more uh, digestible. And here, I forgot to explain my little pictures. Um, so the freedom from agitation, obviously. Well, this is a very clear lake where I, this is my tent. I was going to a Vipassana retreat in Nova Scotia and um, I just decided to, it was a long drive and I pitched my tent there to go to the retreat next day. And um, kind of this idea of like, you know, there's no more craving, no more agitation. And then this engagement is this idea of just um, letting go of, of, the, of the sand and seeing the kind of uh, the flow of impermanence. And the discernment is, I like this uh, simile of the sand dunes for the four foundations of mindfulness where you have 
you know, when, when awareness is uh, completely clear and free from distractions and um, uh, developed, uh, we see things for just what they are as like this kind of, I was talking about bare awareness uh, the other day, uh, it's kind of like touching upon the same thing. It's like uh, the body, the sensations, uh, mind and mind objects or dhammas, dhamma. Uh, I like to see like the sand and the sand dunes as the body and feelings. And then the sky as the mind and the clouds as like whatever is coming in the mind moving through. But that is very clear, you know, like the desert is very kind of pristine and so it's kind of stripped of everything and it's just this, you know, it's very clear awareness of that. But when we, when we see things for what they are, we're not actually clinging to them, we're just seeing it. And so therefore we're letting go, we're disengaging. We're just like, there is that, it's, you, we don't even have to do it. It just happens, that's the beauty of it. It's just, you know, as we practice, we see things for what they are, and that means we're just not clinging, we're just completely present. And that's it. So we're letting go of the sand. And this discernment, this yata bhuta jnana dasana, comes from a cause, it is not independent. So what is the cause for this discernment? What brings about this clear clarity of mind? Mental collectedness, yes, samadhi should be answered. And this is where we start to probably touch base on more familiar grounds, <laughs> where uh, it, it, it makes sense that, so this is what everybody here is doing. So this samadhi, this collectedness of mind, this calm, clarity, um, that's another word for samatha vipassana, I like to call it calm, clarity. And, um, here, uh, that's basically when we have that mental collectedness, uh, which is kind of like uh, the result, then we have that wisdom, we have that discernment, we see things for what they are, and we're not clinging, we're letting go, we're seeing the impermanence. There is no more agitation, and there is uh, uh, the release of mind, basically. So there was a phase where I was translating samadhi as meditation because it does, that's the tricky part about that word is that first of all there's absolutely no English equivalent <laughs> and, um, and the Buddha invented that word most probably because it was not in the earlier Vedas, uh, it was only since the, since the Buddha. Um, and so basically when the Buddha talks about, you know, the threefold training, sila, samadhi, panya, uh, you know, the, the training in virtue, the training in meditation or mental collectedness, because that's clearly very close, uh, mental collectedness, meditation, dhyana, the vehicle of clarity, the vehicle of the mind, uh, so we're really touching on very, you know, uh, similar uh, names. But yes, I think I might have left it there because sometimes I just like to leave it there and give like people another kind of flavor, I guess. But yeah, um, mental collectedness in this in this um, in this sutta, I would use mental collectedness because it refers more to that aspect of having a collected mind, not just meditation. Yeah. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of th things to say about that, but there's a lot of instances in the suttas where the Buddha uses the word samadhi in like basically meaning meditation. Uh, so yeah, practice samadhi monks. With samadhi, you will see things as they truly are. And so mental collectedness comes from a cause. What is the cause for mental collectedness? Very good, sukha, happiness, very good, or ease. Yes. Uh, the word sukha in Tamil actually means comfort. 
in yes yes yeah totally yeah, yeah I mean the the word sukha again is um, and that happens a lot more with uh, Indic languages and uh, Eastern languages I feel the semantic field like the um, the the me the range of meaning is a much bigger for one word than we have in English and we have more words in English and we have even more words in French <laughs> it's actually it's actually quite nice to speak in English because <laughs> there's too many words um, but uh, actually that's something that uh, when I was learning Sinhalese in Sri Lanka um, I really had a hard time because I, and especially being from a French background, what I wanted to share, like my ideas in my mind, had so many words. If I were to translate all of these words in Singhala, like they would listen to me for two seconds and they would be like, who's this guy? You know, like he's just like talking, putting so many words and it's just... It's just like such a much simpler language, like in, in that sense, where you just like go to the core kind of thing all the time. Uh, and so I got to learn that a little bit more there. And so this, this it's kind of like the same thing, you know, the word sukha is used for so many things. And the word dukkha is used for so many things. And the word sukha just means pleasant. The word dukkha just means unpleasant by the way, doesn't mean suffering. <laughs> so really, if we go down to the, the real meaning of it, that's just what it is, it's just unpleasant. But in English, uh, the word happiness, I guess, is just nice to have around, so I like to keep it there. Because if it was ease, then it would, it would I, I use ease, sometimes I'll say both, actually, I'll just say ha happiness and ease. Kind of, I'll just plug it in. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have this uh, little child riding the back of... Uh, sorry, we, I was late, so we don't... It's not in colors, uh, but it's... This child on the elephant is riding a, an elephant in the sunset, and he's got the sun in the back. Uh, and that, I thought that was a really nice image for uh, mental collectedness. And just this <laughs> happy child riding an elephant <laughs> in the sunset. And um, here, this, this happiness comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for happiness? Pasadi. Pasadi, calm. And this would be translated as tranquility. And this calm comes from a cause, it is not independent. What is the cause for calm? Joy should be answered. Very good. And here we have the two wings to awakening, joy and letting go, joy and calm. Upliftment of the mind and tranquility. And when we beat these two little wings, we get happiness and mental collectedness and clarity of mind. And this is just a place in Nelson, just uh, my first uh, time there. Uh, I used to live in the mountain and come down from my kuti and go for alms and sit on that rock um, almost every day and beat the wings. <laughs> hmm. The, I find mountains have this, uh, uh, both these qualities of uplifting, obviously, they're mountains, and, uh, <laughs> and also calm and tranquility because they're really grounding presence. So it's very kind of, uh, so I find it that, um, that combination uh, quite beautiful and helpful for my practice. Uh, apparently, uh, Tibetan Buddhists also. <laughs> Here, joy comes, this joy comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for joy? 
Pamoja. Yes, Pamoja. Very good. And I forgot to explain the little... I, I like the... How do you call that? These, uh, these little balloons at the back? Hot air balloons. Hot air balloons, yes. So I like those because it's that same kind of principle where we kind of in the meditation we drop our little heaviness of mind, we drop, we drop our distractions, our little sandbags, and then we keep putting nice warm air in the balloon and we, we go up and up. So we drop our, everything that's tying us down, weighing us down, and then naturally we're just floating up. It's just the nature of what we do. This relief comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for this relief? Sadda, faith or confidence. And now this is getting interesting. <laughs> and this is the place where I, 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 I kind of have to go down a little bit further because I need more material to play with to explain this. And now we will turn the page. And this faith, this confidence comes from a cause that is not independent. What is the cause for this confidence? The toilet. The toilet. <laughs> Good answer. Yes. Dukkha. Trouble. And this is where uh, this one of the most beautiful things that Bhante would say uh, was that the hindrances, the distractions are your own teachers. They're not there to be pushed away. They're actually bringing you gold. They're bringing you really helpful information. The hindrances, the distractions, they're your friends in the end. They're your teachers. They're showing you exactly what's in your mind, how the mind's been conditioned to behave. And this is our opportunity our power to change, to actually release, relax that, and to smile, to rewire our minds completely. And this is where it happens. And this is my uh, composting toilet. <laughs> in uh, Eastern Canada, I, I had uh, 25 acres of forest uh, in Eastern Canada before I uh, shaved my long hair and uh, went forth. Uh, by myself, I didn't know how it worked, so I just did it and <laughs> and then decided I would just try to figure it out. So, <laughs> and I did. It took me a few years, but <laughs> and so I that was just before I sold everything. I was really into permaculture and uh, going back to the land, and that was my solution at that point, which was quite a quite a good idea too. But um, yeah, it, it become it became more than that. Um, and I like this uh, because in that process I really learned that actually there is no waste and the worst things that you could ever imagine having to deal with which is what you put in a toilet actually it is really 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 good uh, you can turn that into amazing food for plants and actually um, you know, uh, whatever, that, that principle of composting is just amazing. You know, you take all of the things that you can't use and you, you're not going to use and it's just uh, kind of wasted. But actually, you're turning all of that into, like when you're a gardener, like compost is gold, you know. Because the more you have of it, the better your garden's going to be. Like every gardener knows that. <laughs> And if you have too much, you can sell it. <laughs> so, I mean, when you think about that principle, you're never going to experience any bad situations anymore. That's like amazing. I call it the alchemy of the mind. Basically, what we're doing is straight alchemy. We're turning all of the worst mental states in our minds into pure gold. And that's through just right effort, what we've been doing here. 
And so once we understand that, um, we really know how to uh, turn everything that can be a problem, troublesome in our lives into this beautiful thing that we can actually use. And the more you have of it, the, more, the deeper you went, the more you have to give too. And so when you come out of that, you can actually uh, help a lot of people. And so through, through this experience of dukkha, there arises the sadda also, this kind of feeling that, okay, I got to, you know, there, there, was a, there was a time in my life where I, I, did I mention that earlier? Where I said um, that I basically hit rock bottom, like the bottom of my well. That's how I called it. Uh, I couldn't see, you know, any light in my life anymore. And it was basically, that was it. <laughs> it was not a good place to be. I really, uh, uh, through just my own ignorance, not knowing what is skillful, what is unskillful, uh, basically did mistakes and I felt terrible about it. I felt completely terrible and I started, but it was a blessing in disguise. It was that very thing that woke me up to like, hey, you, you need to wake up, you know? And actually now I see like, these were like my angels, you know, telling me you gotta change and you, you gotta be doing something much better than this. And so, um, but through that hardship, that's where the, the nut gets cracked and we have to open up. And this is actually really good. And there there is this sadda that arises. And there's another word in Pali that is called sangwega also. That is that feeling of urgency to actually take action, to change. And if you ask most Buddhist monks, it's usually very similar. Um, they went through a very challenging phase in their life and it changed everything for them. And they just felt like the monastic path was the only way, basically, that made sense anymore for them. Uh, I'm no exception. And that's why I put the, the little Salmonera and I just think it's just kind of cute. He's just like reborn in like Thailand, it seems. And it's just like, you know, because it's, after the whole chain of like rebirth and all that, and he's just like reborn and just like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> just going forth. Like, uh, yeah, anyways, <laughs> I just thought that was kind of cute. Yes. Um, so from the, the confidence, basically, the confidence is where, Sadda is where we have the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So we also have that interplay, that layering of that's where we get the teaching. So that's where the sadda comes from also. Because, for example, for me, I was at the bottom of my well, but I had this one thing was the Dhamma that I just started to discover. And because everything else was shaved off from my life, I just like, that was the only thing that really made sense. And so um, a lot of people, um, well, I mean, in different kind of slightly different ways, some people is more like, a, like even getting even better or, you know, you don't have to be going through a like, huge traumatic <laughs> event uh, like I've been through or like it's some people have, you know, just different lives and better, better qualities or faculties than I had. Um, and so... But there is that element of encountering the Dhamma, gaining faith in the, in the teaching, and therefore in the Buddha, and therefore in the collective of people who are practicing this. And the relief arises from that, from finding that refuge, from finding, not just like in, in words, but in, like it's a feeling in the heart that you feel like, I've come upon a refuge. And, and for some of us, when we say the refuge is like, it's actually really truly how we feel. It's this only refuge in this world that is kind of very, uh, that is unshakable, basically. 
And so <laughs> this is it <laughs> on the light note. Anyways. <laughs> and so here we are going deeper past the toilet, deeper down. Um, and this trouble comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for trouble? Hmm. Interesting. What's the cause for trouble? Birth. Yeah. Yeah, so this is another traumatic uh, vocabulary. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I cut on that pretty fast when I was in Canada and I said like, you know, birth is destroyed. <laughs> Some people were like, okay, this is not good. <laughs> like, so I had to really change that. Because, you know, in the sequence where the, the, somebody uh, becomes awakened, for example, he'll say like, the holy life has been lived, birth has been destroyed basically but we're talking about jati which is like rebirth and it's a whole you know you need to know a lot more about it but uh one of the beautiful things that bante had to bring uh to to us to me anyways that really um he really helped me and, and a lot of people to understand this dependent origination in a, in a simpler way in a more applicable way here and now. And that's what I kind of like to more focus on personally, because we can get very esoteric about it and really philosophical, but um, I find it's really useful and applicable to when we know it in a simpler way. And he would say, basically, um, this is the, the birth of uh, the birth of action, that's what he would say. But I call it uh, blind action or blind reaction. It's like giving rise to uh, blind reactions, which do not have mindfulness in them. That's the thing that happens when you try to send a text message to your friend and you're drinking coffee at the same time on your way to work and you're giving like food to your cats kind of thing. And then you bunk your toe on something. And then you hear me talking about bunking your toe on things uh, because that's kind of like one of my mindfulness checks in life. When I bunk my toe on something, I'm like, all right, Mr. Monk, mindful. <laughs> be mindful and so um, there there is uh, there is no there is no mindfulness and that means all of the unwholesome states that's where they are also like anger when it's to the point where you're going to be shouting at someone are you mindful are you actually thinking for the best of the situation on the moment kind of thing? Or is it just like a reaction? Somebody hits you, you hit them back. It's that phase, it's that point. They tell you something you don't like, you retaliate. That word retaliation, that's, that's where it's found. And usually this is, well, yeah, this is usually called birth in itself, but... Um, the birth of action that is uh, not mindful. Basically. At this point, this section actually, uh, that's why I arrange it like this. Uh, I don't, I really did try my best to not make it linear, by the way, <laughs> because it's always put in a linear way. And I think there is a lot of richness in actually understanding it in different ways. And I put that block there because I find that this is all coming together in some ways. So I would say it's true. Uh, also, it's not, uh, uh, and the way that I explain it, well, you're, you're going to hear it, and then uh, you, you can tell maybe uh, for yourself. And so, these blind reactions come from a cause, they are not independent. What is the cause for these blind reactions? Habitual tendencies, yes, habit patterns. And this is kind of two ways I like to understand that. Habitual tendencies is what Bhante Vimaramsi would say. I like to un also understand it as identity. Um, you know, in, in the big 
kind of classical explanation of um, Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. We're talking about not just one lifetime. So basically this would be the birth of the next being kind of thing. And in this, um, uh, bhava would be like the, the becoming aspect, like the, that force, that momentum that kind of pulls, uh, pushes somebody through uh, samsara and until rebirth, basically, until birth. But that's very esoteric and you need to believe in rebirth and I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I mean, um, you can choose to believe in it or not, or we can really understand it in a practical way here. Uh, because it really does work, you know, uh, in terms of uh, understanding how we're bringing up, like creating ourselves, basically creating our own identity. And I would say birth of identity actually would, would, be, uh, would be quite valid for birth. And so here we have um, habitual tendencies um, which have already been accumulated. Um, you have my, my sister here. Uh, she's, uh, this is uh, my family's trip in to uh, British Columbia when I wasn't born yet. She's uh, very small. And she's my big sister, um, and she's fixing the the wheel of the camper van, um, and she she's really believing that she's uh, she's a mechanic, and so I just thought it was really cute. Um, <laughs> she's fixing the caravan, and um, probably because she saw my dad do it, and she thought mm, I want to do that too, and this is how it how it works. Um, and um, so she picked it, she picked that up. She wanted to be like her dad, and then she's uh, kind of fixing the tire, and uh, she's really believing that that's what she, she is. Um, anyways, <laughs> I'm not gonna go. Um, th there's gonna be more family stuff coming, <laughs> uh, and uh, this ha these habitual tendencies are this identity comes from a cause it is not independent what is the cause for identity attachments and this is where it starts to get interesting again is that basically because of attachments and we have wanting before we have wanting and then we have attachment um, and then we have identity that is like this encapsulating all of that. But attachment, what is identity? It is just this bundle of attachment. <laughs> and this is what I was explaining with my uh, analogy with language earlier, is that we have this bank of expression, of physical gestures, of verbal expressions that we have that we think this is how I express myself. This is how I talk. And uh, all of that was accumulated by years and years and years of talking. You can see that really well. That's the best in children. Children will just behave exactly like their mom and dad. They're like going to say exactly the same thing. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's just like you can see that process very clearly. It's like, um, I'm going to say the same exact same expression, the exact same words. Um, my sister has uh, two kids, two, uh, well, then no, they're getting bigger, uh, my two nephews. And when they were born, they, you know, uh, they definitely had a personality of themselves. They were definitely, uh, one was more like uh, his mom and the other one was more like his dad. But um, they also, you know, just seeing them recently and they've picked up a lot of, you know, their parents. And, you know, I see one of them, Antoine, he's just like talking like his dad, like, like making little jokes and like things is kind of like funny. And he is actually. <laughs> but that's, that's what's happening here. And we accumulate all of these things. And this is why, again, we can't really see it very clearly. But this is my, um, my old job just before I went forth. Uh, I used to be um, 
a market gardener in a very big organic greenhouse in eastern Canada. And uh, this is my propagation area. And that's why I like to translate the word papancha, which is usually proliferation into propagation, because I'm just an old gardener. <laughs> That's really what happens in the propagation room. You know, you have trays of like hundreds of and thousands of little seedlings. And, you know, that's where you just start. You, you, you choose which seeds you want to grow because depending on what you want to do or what's your, I don't know, uh, target uh, <laughs> uh, market. And, uh, and then you just <laughs> spread it out. You know, you, you make it grow. And then you have different phases, you know, you have to, uh, um, different areas for different stages. And so this is what's happening. We're just planting these little seedlings. And then uh, at, at the end of the day, we have a big garden that we call me. This is, this is my garden. This is who I am. And I also, um, yeah, I'll come back to that analogy later. Uh, we're getting more towards the computer stuff soon. <laughs> and so uh, this, uh, this attachment, these attachments come from a cause. They are not independent. What is the cause for attachments? Wanting, craving. That's the big one, the big word. And by the way, attachment is usually upadana and uh, Upadana is usually clinging. That's the classical understanding. And I, f I find craving a, a, little bit, a little bit rough uh, sometimes, just because it's kind of a... <laughs> uh, it's a big word, I find, for, for what it can be sometimes. Because sometimes I feel like, I don't know, like craving, I, I see this like big hairy monster with like big teeth and like <laughs> drooling kind of thing. Like, <laughs> it's just like eating everything but craving like tanha is just like this discontent or just this light pull like uh, uh, venerable was saying yesterday or the day before that kind of like that magnetic pull so it's not like the big furry monster like uh, so it it's kind of more manageable, I find, when you see it like it's, it's wanting or it's this slight discontent, which is like at the root of things. It's like this little thing, actually. It's not that big. Craving, for me in Pali, would be like ragatanha uh, or like a, one, uh, another word which has more like of a strong connotation to it of like really kind of like that strong desire kind of thing. By the way, one of the things that uh, really made me want to go forth at the, at the very end was I went to the grocery store and there's, <laughs> there's this big sign on the grocery store. It's like, crave more. <laughs> and I was like, this is it. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I'm out, guys. And so uh, this is, um, so with craving, this is me. And my uh, big sister, she's, uh, she's holding a caterpillar. And I just really want to hold it. Because I, I want to be like my, my big sister. And so I'm doing this pouty face. And so that's, that's craving right there. From here, now we have uh, this wanting uh, comes from a cause. It is not independent. And now we're going to go more into like the nuts and bolts of what's, what's this wanting? Where does it arise from? What's the soil it arises from? from? Vedana. Vedana. Which is usually uh, translated as feeling. Uh, this word is, is valid. It has a few... Uh, it, can bring up a few intricacies uh, because feeling in English is like feelings or like emotions. That's not really what is meant here. Uh, what is meant is like uh, more like a sensory kind of feeling, like an experience. Actually, Vedana is a word that I more and more translate as experience. Uh, either felt experience or just experience, uh, plain. 
And this is to compare to yesterday's sutta, uh, where we had the sense doors impinging on an object and this creating consciousness. Well, this is also where that would be. Uh, this is that sensory consciousness where it is. And this experience, this Vedana, uh, is, uh, the Buddha often said, there's three kinds of Vedanas, there's three kinds of experience. There is unpleasant, 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 pleasant, pleasant neither. neither. Yes, very good. And so this is what is meant here. There is these three, three kinds of experiences, and that's it. We're not speaking really about emotions or... Uh, emotions would be more like um, at the level of um, blind reactions or uh, depending on which emotion we're talking about here. Unwholesome emotions. This Vedana, this experience or feeling or feeling tone, some, pe some people translate it like that, uh, comes from a cause that is not independent. What is the cause for experience? Contact, very good. And so this is where we had this explanation yesterday. There is a sense, like the ear, there is an object, like, um, well, earlier this retreat, it was the, the wood stove, and then Zen came and rescued <laughs> the retreat. Um, then there is that banging on the, the wood stove, and then there is uh, a sound consciousness, or... Uh, auditive consciousness arising. And so we're starting to see, oh, okay, so this is quite like mechanical, right? It's quite uh, devoid of anything that we're in charge of. It's not really up to us at this point. Uh, this contact is dependent, uh, is, uh, comes from a cause that is not independent. What is the cause of contact? So what do you think if we didn't have the six senses, could we have any kind of contact at the six senses? <laughs> yes, very good. That sounds quite logical. This is like the rational part. <laughs> rational, mechanical, this is like the nuts and bolts here. This is not like we don't have a choice here. We do have a choice at craving or wanting or tanha or discontent. Above our experience, we have the six senses, we have contact, which is like these 11 million bits or whatever you want to say. <laughs> we'll have a good talk with that, I guess. Um, but then, uh, that's why I put uh, the matrix at the back, because this is just the raw data. This is the raw matrix. There's no choice there. It's just like, this is the information. This is the sensory information coming in, and there's a lot of it. And what we do from there, that's where the choice is. But we can't control the senses. We can't control that bottom part here. And so this, these six senses come from a cause. They are not independent. What is the cause of the six senses? Monks and nuns. Nama rupa. Nama rupa should be answered. Mind and body, mentality, materiality. Um, what's another translation? Name and form. Uh, I really like the analogy of the computer where there is the hardware and there's the software. And so you put the two together, you have a working computer. And this is how it works. And so there's different levels in this, but you need the hardware. The, like the software needs the hardware. The hardware is useless without the software. So that's the body and the mind. And so from, from this mind and body complex, Nama Rupa, there is the senses. Again, it's very practical. We can't really change anything about that. That's like we're born with this and that's it. This is the truth. And this mind and body comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for mind and body? Consciousness, vijnana. And this is the first term tonight that is the same. <laughs> Yay! 
I'm so curious how you're yeah. going to translate that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> yes. Consciousness. Uh, I mean, yeah, it could be awareness. It could be, um, yeah, uh, in that kind of field. But, yeah, I feel like consciousness is a good word, actually. We, jnana, is actually a consciousness. And consciousness is a compound that comes from con, which is with in Latin, uh, and sire, which is like science or knowledge. So with knowledge, we, jnana, very similar. So that's, that's actually pretty good, spot on. There are some words that, <laughs> that are quite good. In some sutta, uh, the Buddha says, if there was not this consciousness, and now we're talking about more like the big kind of, big dependent origination, like uh, many lifetimes kind of thing. Um, if there wasn't this consciousness descending in the womb, then there wouldn't be the generation of Nama Rupa, basically. That's kind of philosophical, but um, in other suttas, the Buddha says, uh, actually that's another sutta I'm translating uh, at the moment, it's the Diga Nikaya uh, 15, the Maha Nidana Sutta, the great discourse on causation. And in that sutta, he explains that Nama Rupa is dependent on consciousness, and that's another version, and, and then consciousness is also dependent on Nama Rupa. So they're like two uh, bundles, two uh, kusa grass stacks laying on each other. And once you remove one, the other one falls. So because consciousness technically is kind of nama. And so basically it's part of nama rupa at the same time. So we can understand it like that. And this consciousness, monks and nuns, comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for consciousness? Sankara. Sankara, yes. And now this is very interesting. This is one of my favorite parts of this Dhamma, where we understand that um, I choose to translate Sankara here as mental activity. Sankara is another one of these words which is really hard to translate in English. Uh, first of all, it is used for different things in different places. So one word doesn't, cannot be used for all of it. And uh, it's like one of these words like Dhamma, like it means teaching, it means a thing, it means, you know, a process, it means, it means so many things, it's just unreal, the amount of uh, meaning that we can pull out of that word but um, this is why we read the sequence on Nibbana this is peaceful etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato sabupadi patinisago tanha kayo virago nirodo nibbana every morning this is peaceful this is sublime namely the stilling of all processes in that, in that edition, I translated it as processes, mental processes. Sankara also means like a force or like a doing, like a momentum. So it's that idea that there's something going on, that Sankara is being conditioned, it's created. And mental activities is in the, along the same lines. Uh, we, you can't always translate it like that. But in certain contexts, uh, it works really well. And so it's that it's these conditionings, these activities of the mind that are just happening. And here we start to notice that actually the Buddha is saying that consciousness is not everlasting. I mean, he's explaining that in many of the suttas where he ex he's explaining right view and wrong view, basically. Uh, wise understanding and uh, unwise understanding and he's saying that uh, because at, at his time and, and in our time too there are loads of spiritual teachings that end with a, a pure consciousness that is like everlasting ever present behind all of things and uh, actually even in Buddhism it, it has taken root uh, but the Buddha was quite clear in the early suttas that 
there is something beyond that. And that's not that it's wrong. It's not like it's a, a bad attainment. It's a great attainment. It's a great realization that that clear awareness behind all things. But the Buddha said, but there is also Nibbana, <laughs> which is a little bit further where all processes, all mental activities are completely broken out, liberated. And then there's the, the blowing out. Nibbana is a loaded term again. Uh, it's used in many contexts, many situations. It can be used as a meditation kind of um, stage at the, for example, at the, at the end uh, that is compared to cessation, but it doesn't only mean that. It means just, it can be just the Nibbana, the, ses the blowing out of greed, hate and delusion. And it is ultimately the blowing out of greed, hate, and delusion completely in an individual. So Nibbana is just not a meditation attainment. It's actually a way of being, a way of embodying this teaching, which is devoid of greed, hate, and delusion. Every time you use the six R's, you see the distraction, you see the attachment there. There is the buying into a storyline or whatever it is, there is tension. Then you release, you relax. There's that relief. That is Nibbana also. We can, there is evidence for that in the suttas. Basically, the Buddha basically says exactly what I just said. So every time you let go of greed, that is Nibbana. Every time you let go of hate, that is Nibbana. And so we need to understand, you know, like the Buddha used these terms quite flexibly. You know. And this particular um, approach is really um, precious to me and uh, I, I really love this part of dependent origination where it's so profound. We're, we're seeing that actually consciousness is like this cloud of starlings, these little birds that fly around. And it looks like a cloud, but it's thousands of birds. And that's what Sankara Pachaya Vinyana is. These mental activities, these mental conditionings create that cloud that we think is consciousness. But actually in, in nature, at the very back of it all, consciousness is actually an, act, an active process that is running in the background. And as it gets bro uh, spaced out and released and released and released, it just blows out. And there is that release, there is that, uh, there is that uh, one of the kinds of Nibbana that we can call, uh, there is the blowing out, and there is great relief in this, obviously. The mind is so active, we don't even know how much it's active until we actually taste the opposite. And then we can, we can actually have a vantage point to tell uh, oh, okay, so that actually exists. And uh, yet, to see that doesn't necessarily mean anything in itself uh, if we actually don't change. <laughs> so if there's no change in the behavior, then it's all the same. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. In the end, the, the Buddha was very clear. It's about the fetters. It's about greed, hate, and delusion. It's, if you think you're an arahant and then you get angry at some people, well then, sorry, but you're not. <laughs> Need to check the behavior. So, and, but, this is kind of like my disclaimer and warning and caution around this, because, you know, you don't want to like start to believe things uh, that are not real, but this is how it works, and this is the process of vijnana, the process of consciousness. And I have uh, these little seedlings here because the sankharas are uh, um, uh, called uh, sometimes like the seeds, you know, the, the little seeds that are like latent, dormant in the mind. There's like millions of them, and they just need that little bit of water and sunshine, and they're like, poof, they just grow. And when causes and conditions arise, then they, they, just, they just grow on their own. There's like, it's a bag of seeds, basically. Uh, Vinyana is a bag of seeds. 
And then there's also the computer analogy where you know you have uh, you have basically the raw data that was interpreted uh, with wanting and then uh, attachment repetition. Um, the raw data was kind of coded as our behavior, and then we've made like little softwares, you know, in in our personality, in our identity. This is how we run. You know, I have a software that says uh, I'm a Buddhist monk. I have another software that says uh, I'm a, uh, I'm nobody. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a, I'm I was a gardener. I have another software that says another thing, and you know, the more we have of these, the more we have a complex identity around it, and the more the belief in identity is strong. But this also is a flexible process and a gradual process, and we actually let go slowly of this, and it weakens the whole chain. Every time we relax, we let go of distractions, it's easy, it just weakens the whole chain. It makes a lot of space and room for awareness and wholesome states. The, the coding that we've used to make the softwares, well, the softwares, they, they start running in the background. Like they just operate in the background and that's, those are the sankharas. And so there's different levels. Like you can exit a few windows. Like that's what we're doing on retreat. You know, you, we're, we're quitting a few programs, <laughs> ending tasks, <laughs> defragging, <laughs> and then and then we actually, you know, we actually loosen up the sankharas. There's not as many that come up. So let's see, it's the same thing. So we're cleaning out the operating system of the mind. So this is what we're doing on retreat and I have a little little uh, video for you again I was not uh, f well prepared but we're gonna have to become familiar with each other uh, I guess I would invite everybody to come to the front and you can sit down Please. let's all sit down I think in the classical understanding, you would get probably a, a, a bit of a more complicated answer, uh, where like about the word formations and like what what it means in the commentaries and um, like this is where the Abhidhamma is starting to get very big on on that aspect. Personally, I that's I I think the the Buddha's teaching when it's understood in its most simple expression it goes the deepest uh, in in my opinion but um, that's why I don't go uh, into very great uh, intricate elaboration here um, but yeah I, I would agree I would agree that formation is you know that's another it's, it's a it's another good word one of the reasons why I don't translate as uh, formations, well, because it's just really used, and uh, but also sometimes it's translated as volitional formations, and that I really struggled to understand, like what was meant behind that, and you know what was the principle, and why why choosing. I understand there is like, it's basically put in simple terms it's basically volitional because there's that momentum there that is latent so that volitional latency is kind of there but uh and then formation is like uh it gets w willfully kind of crafted it gets willfully um conditioned at this point uh through this whole process that we just saw with bhava and uh, uh, upadana. 
uh, I feel like uh, Sankara is just also like the storehouse of everything. That's kind of where everything is just latent and stored and whenever and like uh, inclinations, the uh, Anusayas also, that's kind of where they're, in my understanding, that's where they would be stored in certain ways. This is where uh, uh, cr uh, craving, clinging, uh, uh, tanha, uh, upadana, uh, bhava is all kind of slowly accumulating and getting stored back into sankaras, like latent. Like somebody, uh, some you know, you ha spend some time with people that react in a certain way or like a, that are. Uh, more aggressive then you kind of pick up these things you know you you store them up and and then you spend time with people that are the opposite then same thing so mm -hmm. sometimes i've seen intention but mm. i think intention maybe should be a bit later because mm. it requires a bit more thinking involved Whereas yeah it seems like it's much more raw than yeah, I would say that too. I would say that uh, Sankara's condition intention. So the, what we're doing is we're purifying our intention all the time. And we're creating basically wholesome Sankaras that will purify our intention. And hopefully when situations arise, we will come from that space of presence and um, yeah. like uh, bringing presence into our intention so that they remain wholesome yeah. so it's like it's really that cycle of yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> great yes uh, yes some some kinds of sankaras yes yes mm -hmm but they will be fully wholesome. And I used the word arahant earlier, but I meant like any stage of awakening or, you know, uh, I didn't meant to be, mean to be specific or... Uh, so any arahant who is alive will have some kind of Yes, of course, there, there has to be. But it will be the wholesome one, so there is no ignorance and all that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's always this clear awareness, uh, this presence of mind. Uh, there are the Ayu Sankaras, the vital formations, which are required to keep the body alive. That's, that's one thing. Um, and then there... Um, but then there are basically that, that seed bank uh, is fully wholesome. So there's nothing in there that could like provoke anger or even restlessness, you know, uh, to that level. Yeah. Yes. Well, basically, well, if I try to understand and answer you that in the way that I understand it, um, there's technically three kinds of sankaras. There is the kaya sankara, the wachi sankara, and the chitta sankara. So there is the sankaras, the formations or the activities or the processes of the body. There are uh, those of speech, language, and mind. And so the Buddha said, um, basically, anything that is pertaining to the body, like, like, like the breath, but any, any kind of bodily uh, activity is tied, is the kaya sankara. And then he said that the wachi sankara, the verbal formations, are... Um, uh, vitaka vichara, uh, thinking and reflection. And then he said that the chitta sankara, the sankaras of the mind, the mental formations, mental activities are uh, perception and uh, feeling, perception and experience. Observe sankaras. Yes. Yeah, it... it um, well, at this point... You you get you you see sankaras all the time. I mean, whenever your mind is distracted, that's a sankara, um, and then it gets subtler and subtler. 
So uh, it depends at what, what level we're talking. But um, at, the level of, um, at the level of mind, of mental formations, um, let's say at the deepest end of the path, for example, of, of the meditative path, which is not the end of the actual awakening path, um, there is, you know, there is the plane of bare awareness, which we call the clear mind, the still mind. And then from there, which is basically a satipatthana, just seeing mind as mind. And then um, at that point, um, sometimes people will start, will see things like, uh, like flashing lights or like geometrical patterns or things like that. And um, it's just the mind kind of getting rid of its coarser kind of deeper it doesn't make any sense like the th things that are coming up it is just like completely disconnected it's it doesn't make any sense it's like a ran random thoughts and ideas that are just like it wasn't there kind of like hanging out floating around you know <laughs> like <laughs> and but they have to come out because they were there and they were like causing this kind of like kind of tension and um and then once they get released and that's why we we like at that level especially we tell people yeah, that's okay. Just uh, perceptions arising, passing away. No worries. Just keep keep relaxing, keep releasing, and then um, and that that can be understood as sankaras. And I used to do uh, really long canoe trips, uh, canoe expeditions, in uh, northern Quebec, and we would um, paddle up rivers and then paddle down uh, because it was really far and it was like thirty plus days. Uh, self-sufficient uh, expeditions with like there's nobody <laughs> and um, I, I really find the, a lot of similarities between um, what we call I know it's getting late but uh, <laughs> what we call um, basically uh, drainage divides and so with the landscape uh, like here for example you get the mountains and all that all of the landscape with like the rock, the mountain formation, um, the way that the water falls and uh, there's like a ridge, for example, and then on one side, water will flow this way and then the other side will flow the other way. And so, for example, that drainage divide, it's like there's like, I don't know, five major drainage divides in Quebec, for example. And then they have like these maps of explaining what it is and all of that water in this zone is flowing like in this river kind of thing so you can s know where you're going what's gonna you know are you gonna paddle down or paddle up because <laughs> it changes a lot <laughs> of things and so um but as we were paddling up to get to our river uh which was quite strenuous uh, at some point you know you, you paddle you have a big flow a big river and takes a lot of strength and then at some point like it gets narrower that you actually you branch out and then you start paddling a, a smaller creek and you kind of haul your canoe and it's heavy and uh, but you still you, you keep going and then it's it gets really really small and you get to a place we would we would get to the place where it was like a kind of like a like because it was quite far up north so it was like tundra and there was not a lot of vegetation like few little trees but not that much it was beautiful like bare granite and waterfalls but he, at that point there was barely enough water to see and you couldn't actually see where it was going and i i would like take some uh, rip off some rip out some uh, little pieces of uh, grass and throw them in the water as like we were, we would be portaging our, our canoes and I would just like throw some and it would just like flow and then I would just go that way basically to because there would be like many branches and it becomes a marsh basically and at that point there's it's not clear whether it's like is there water there's no more enough water to bring your canoe awareness consciousness to you have to like kind of there's no more water and it's like this marshy place where there's like nothing and water and nothing and water and that's like neither perception and non-perception and then you get to that ridge where it's dry 
in terms of meditation at that point you can't really know because because what would know when there's no consciousness then you, you can't there's no consciousness <laughs> that's, the, that's the trick it's like it's just and getting rid of all the attachments that consciousness has to be consciousness is really intricate it's it's like a package and so you have to kind of a meditator has to kind of unpack it, unpack it, unpack it, make room, make room. And it takes time at, at that meditation level. We're talking about the sweet spot that I found uh, um, re repetitively with people is like around four and a half hours of sitting. Um, and that meaning like not torturing yourself for four and a half hours, but actually sitting comfortably moving as less as you can if you need to adjust your legs to like kind of take a break you can um, just be kind on yourself and your body but mind needs that these hours to really kind of empty the whole thing you can coming out one can see because it's this really fine interplay of trusting enough in the release process and finding comfort in that neither perception and non-perception place like that marshy land where it's like there's not enough awareness to be aware all the time but uh, you're slowly getting used to it and kind of being more comfortable with the idea that well yeah actually there's that space where I can actually let go more or like there's that, uh, that's, it's possible, basically. And then as one becomes more familiar with that, uh, coming, coming in, going out, coming in, going out, uh, one can start to see the active nature of consciousness, therefore answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I was giving a talk here. <laughs> um, I think, right, okay. And these mental activities come from a cause. They are not independent. What is the cause of mental activities? Oh, ignorance. Is this ignorance? Ignorance, yes. yes. Avija. Which, I, is it? Yeah. I translate this here as lack of discernment because that is another trauma triggering word um, ignorance so isn't it beautiful now nobody's ignorant anymore <laughs> but there is some lack of discernment sometimes <laughs> it goes a little goes down a little bit better <laughs> and uh, yeah of course uh, we can play on words uh, but if we are to indulge in tanha, upadana, bhava and jati then uh, these are the blinders we're putting the blinders on and blinders on, blinders on and it's hard to choose uh, properly there's lack of discernment we can't see, ah, vija there's no, we can't see it's like it's, there's no knowledge and that's, be, that's why we take blind actions, blind reactions. But this whole practice that we've been doing here is about cultivating exactly the opposite. And when we cultivate the beginning of the path, the beginning, the transcendental part of dependent origination, the seven supports of enlightenment, the seven factors of enlightenment, we are coming out of that we're making space, we're loosening up the chains, and uh, this is the goal here. Sequence, lack of discernment brings about mental activities. Mental activities bring about consciousness brings about mind and body bring about the six senses bring about sensory contact brings about experience brings about 
Wanting brings about. Attachments bring about. Habitual tendencies bring about. Blind actions bring about. Trouble. And trouble brings about. <laughs> Confidence brings about. And relief brings about. Joy brings about. Calm brings about. Happiness brings about. Wonderful mental collectedness brings about. Discernment brings about. Disengagement brings about. Freedom from agitation brings about. Release brings about. Just as when it pours down heavily on the mountain tops, monks and nuns, that water rushes down, filling the main valleys and gorges. The main valleys and gorges being full, they fill up the streams. The streams being full, they fill up the creeks. The creeks being full, they fill the rivers. The rivers being full, they fill the estuaries. The estuaries being full, they fill the great ocean. And so it goes with this dependent origination. And if we let go, then we slowly calm down the flow of the river and we see it's all just going. And we be happy. Okay, I think that's enough. <laughs> mm. You've been very good. So it has dependent origination. It's one of my favorite to explain it because it has dependent origination and it also has the way out of it, which is positive and uplifting. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired. For the acquisition of all kinds of happiness, may beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad.